Hello. Hello. Um, let's, sorry, I'm running a little late. Um, all right. So this week we were working on sections 3.1, and 3.5. So we started taking derivatives this week, correct? Um, let's go to my page. So yeah, um, a lot of what this week is is just kind of like powering through and like memorizing these rules and just like making sure that you're like just aware of like what all of the different rules are. Um, and a lot of the times, at least for me, um, it was mostly just practice to pick up the answers to what these problems would be. Um, so starting with 3.1, sorry, I'm gonna adjust my screen a little bit here. So starting with 3.1, um, and you can stop me anytime if you have any specific questions or um, if you want me to like go over something again. Um, and yeah, 3.1. Uh, so 3.1 address the polynomials basically, so power rules, sum and difference type stuff. Um, and Sum and difference is like pretty intuitive in that you can just like take the sum of the derivatives. Um, but the power rule sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so I would like to do number six, which looks a little something like this. Um, and then number 10, which looks like this. Um, so for number six, uh, what do we think the derivative for this is, or how would we find it? Any ideas? Is this the one where you multiply the constant by the power and then subtract one from the power? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sorry. No. <laughs> I'm in section 3. Point, like next week's, I guess, study guide right now working. So <laughs> I oh, care yeah, yeah, yeah. what I'm doing. <laughs> so yeah, this is like probably, if you're already looking ahead to next week, this might be a little old hat. Um, but you basically multiply it, the front part, by whatever the power is. And then this gets turned into 4 thirds minus 1. And when I have fractions, I just like to write 1 as a fraction. So 4 thirds minus 3 thirds. And so this becomes, this is my prime, um, 4 thirds x to the 1 third. So what about number 10? Um, what is the strategy for approaching number 10? I would rewrite it as a negative exponent first. Yes. And from here, we can treat it just like any other um, power rule. So this gets turned into negative 4x to the negative 4 minus 1. And the important part here is that this stay, it becomes more negative, right? Um, sometimes I'll accidentally turn this into like a negative 3 because I think I'm trying to like get closer to 0, but this actually is negative 5 now. Uh, so yeah, um, let's maybe try number, before I put that one on the list, but I don't like it. Let's also do number 28 maybe. So number 28 looks like this. So this one is basically, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, how would I want to rewrite this in order to better use my rules? Um, 
Well, this can probably stay the same. Um, what would this term be simplified in, in some way that I could use the power rule more easily? 12t to the negative one half. Exactly. Because the square root of t is equal to t to the one half. And so if we have it underneath there in the denominator, then it is the negative one half. Um, and then just like we did last time, this term is going to be simplified like that. So now we have something that we can use um, the power rule on more easily. And then for sum and differences, we can just say that y prime is going to be equal to the derivative of all of these different terms, either added or subtracted to one another. So what is this derivative going to end up being? 16. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to do in your head. So I'll write it out like this. And then minus. So this becomes 6t, and then this is minus 6t to the minus 3 halves, and then plus 4, plus, four plus 2, sorry, uh, t to the minus 3. Does that make sense? All right. Um, does anyone have any questions about using the power rule? Or do we want to move on and try to do um, exponential rule logs and then trig functions? Let's try doing something through point two. Let's do, let's do two. And let's do, let's do right. Okay. So for number two, um, what am I going to start doing? What is this going to look like? Would it be 2ex plus 2x? Exactly. This is not going to change because we have e to the x. Um, and this coefficient up here is just one. And then we're going to use the power rule for uh, x squared. What about number eight? Can we use the power rule in number eight? The important thing here, and I think we talked a little bit about this last week, is recognizing that this may be like a polynomial, but this is like an exponential function because my x is up here in the exponent spot. So can we use the power rule here? The answer is no. But can we use exponential rules? The answer is yes. So you can brute force memorize exactly what the rule is for this type of problem, um, which is uh, 
uh, something like this. Um, and it relates to e to the x in that if a is equal to e, then ln e is equal to 1, right? So this would basically, sorry, I'm jumping into my solving area. This is basically saying that the derivative of e to the x is equal to 1 times e to the x, going by this rule here in the red. Um, so that is certainly one way to do it. Um, you could also rewrite all of these. Um, anything that's written in the form a to the x, if you remember earlier, can also be written in the form e to the kx, where a is equal to e to the k. So if you really wanted to, you could figure out, um, and you had a calculator, you could figure out what k was. Um, and k is going to be equal to ln a. So a is equal to e to the ln a, which also makes sense based upon our rules of like exponents and logs, right? Because e to the natural log of something is just going to be that something because the exponent, the e to the, and then the natural log is going to cancel out. Is everybody cool with me up to there? So that's kind of why this rule works. I always forget that this rule exists and I always kind of like default down to a is equal to e to the k, uh, a to the x is equal to e to the kx and then just have to prove to myself almost every time that um, my k is gonna be l and a, but um, that might just be a me thing. But if everyone's good with that, um, what do we think the answer to this problem is gonna be? Any ideas? Well, that will be the natural log of two times two to the x. And then we're gonna add it to what? I think the question here is, is this? is two times three to the x, six to the x. The answer to this is no, these are not the same. So when we're looking at something like this, we have to recognize that this is gonna be like a constant. So this is going to be plus two times whatever the derivative of three to the x is. And using this exact same rule, it's going to be the natural log of three times three to the x. So our final answer is gonna look something like this. Does that make sense? Any questions? So I guess, is there an easy way to tell, like when we're supposed to use that as a constant versus taking the derivative of the number two? Um, well, the difference here is, is that it is, first of all, not separated by a plus sign. Um, so this two times three to the x is two times three to the x. If you had it written as, um, if you had a polynomial instead, for instance, it would be written like two times x to the three, right? So we don't have this multiplication sign there, but we have to make that distinction because it would look like a 23 otherwise. Um, and mostly what I do is I look at things and I break them down by like the plus and minus signs. So this is a chunk here separated by a plus sign, and then this is a chunk here. Um, and then in the last one, there would be like a minus, there was a minus sign, and then there was another chunk. Um, and so I kind of break it down into um, like more manageable bytes, but those bytes are like separated by the addition and subtraction because those are the only things that kind of carry over because 
the addition and subtraction rule basically says that um, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Does that make sense? So if we were adding the two there, the two would cancel out because the derivative of two is zero, correct? Um, if we had a plus two here, then the derivative would have a plus zero. Okay. Um, because we would have like chunk A right here, which I kind of drew an arrow to is this chunk. And then we would have chunk B right here where this two is a constant and it's multiplied by something with a variable in it. Um, and that would be this answer. And then we would have this last plus two, which would become a plus zero. I guess that, that's what I was wondering. Since we're multiplying it, we include it, correct? And then yeah. if we were adding it, we would not. Exactly. Um, that's another, like, one of the reasons I like to use, like, plus and minus signs as kind of, like, signposts. Um, but it's also, I mean, one thing I do is I, if I have, like, a situation where I'm, like, I'm not sure if this would be, like, the case, what should I do here? I would turn this 2 to the 3x into something that I was more familiar with, like x to the third. And then I would ask, do I drop this too if I'm taking the derivative of this? And the answer is no, because I'm multiplying it. Um, it's multiplied by this. Um, so the answer is going to end up being 6 squared if I take the derivative, right? Um, so this is something I know how to handle. And now if I'm looking up here and I have almost the exact same situation, I have something with a variable in it and then a constant multiplied by it, I'm going to treat the constant in the exact same way. Because if math is one thing, it is consistent. Uh, let's try another couple problems. Um, let's do question number 14. And let's do 18. And then let's do 20. So for number 14, what are we thinking? Negative 4e to the negative 4t. Exactly. Um, perfect. One thing I'll just note is that this t didn't come down. It was only the constant that was attached to it. Um, so this isn't negative 4t e to the negative 4t, it's just negative 4 e to the negative 4t, which is just a mistake that I see some people make sometimes. Um, but precisely, exactly. What about number 18? Um, first of all, where have we seen this before? We saw this stuff all the time when we were thinking about um, like exponential functions and we were solving them with um, like natural logarithms and stuff like that. Um, so this is just like a familiar um, a to the t, p naught a to the t form, essentially, if you remember. So what are we thinking here? What does p prime of t look like? Is this 3,000 going to be a constant? I would say no. Why do you say that? Because you have to multiply it by the 1.02. No, um, this is like pretty much this, the same like issue that we ran into last time where we had like a multiple sign, multiplication sign there. Um, gotcha, so it is a constant. It is a constant. Um, one of the 
again, like to signpost with those at addition and subtraction signs. This is the number just out in front here, and it's multiplied by this thing with the variable. Um, so one idea maybe to do is separate things into constants, which don't have a variable like actively like acting on them, versus this thing, which is to the power of t, an exponential function. Um, so this 3000 is going to stay with us, and it's going to be multiplied by the derivative of 1.02 to the t. So what is this going to look like? What is the derivative of 1.02 to the t? Natural log of t. Is it the natural log of t? We're going to be using that um, a to the x, uh, the derivative of a to the x is equal to natural log a times a to the x. Cool. So it'd be natural log 1.02 to the t. Mm -hmm. So natural log 1.02, and then we're also multiplying it by 1.02 to the t. So we have three parts to this final answer. We have the constant, which just stuck around. Um, we have this part, which I'm going to call k. And then this part, which is essentially the original. Um, and the reason I'm calling it k again is because if I have a to the x is equal to e to the kx, which is true, we can have any number a equal to e to the k as long as k is some number. And it just so happens, if I take the natural log of both sides, this turns into k is equal to ln a, right? Or I can say that e to the ln a is equal to a. So we've established that ln a is equal to k. So if we reframe this a little bit, um, the way that I could write this part of the problem is I need to take the derivative of e to the natural log of 1.02 times t. And is that maybe an easier thing to solve? Keep my 3,000. And now, just like I did over here with that negative 4, I brought that negative 4 down. I'm going to bring this natural log of 1.2 down. So this turns into the natural log of 1.02 times my original function, which is e to the natural log of 1.02 times t. And as we said, this is equal to a, or rather 1.02. Does that all make sense? I know working with these types of exponential functions can be really weird, especially if you don't have a ton of like practice with them. Um, and the really weird ones are the ones that are not E, because then you get all sorts of wonky stuff happening. Um, so for me, at least, if I ever have something that is a to the t, a to the x or a to the t, I just turn it into e to the k because that's just easier for me to work with um, because I know how to deal with ease because it's exactly what we did over here. Okay. 
how are we feeling about number 18? Any other questions? Okay, what about number 20? Is C a constant or is it going to get turned into a zero? First of all. It's a constant. Yep. So C is going to be sticking around. And then we have to take the derivative of this part with the variable. What is that going to look like? Isn't that just e to the t? Mm -hmm. So in this case, our derivative is exactly like our original function. Um, and maybe this might help with the constant, just to like make sure that we're all on the same page with the constants. I think the official rule looks something like this. Um, which basically says that if you have the derivative of something, this is our function that has, this is the part with the variable, quote unquote, and then this is the stuff that it's multiplied to. Um, we basically aren't taking the derivative of the stuff that it's multiplied to, but we do have to multiply it by this final derivative. Um, are you guys familiar, like comfortable with Leibniz notation, which is this DDX stuff? Do you like feel okay if I use that or? Sometimes it's easier to like see the primes, just like, because it's a lot more familiar of like notation. I'm fine with it this week. Uh, the week that we're in currently, a little bit different story. Okay. Um, I love Leibniz notation, and I didn't realize how much I loved it until I started like teaching this kind of stuff to people, because you can be so specific with Leibniz notation. You're like very specific about like what you're doing and what you're doing it to. And you can write it down like it's a function, essentially. If you have like an input output and your input is your, you know, as you would a function, you would your input would be your original function and your output would be the derivative. And so you can kind of write that down in a way. Um, so I really like using Leibniz notation. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was cool with it. Um, okay, let's also do, um, let's see, I wanted to do, wanted to, let's do number 27 actually. Number 27 looks something like this. We have two parts to this. We have the exponential part and then the natural log part. Anyone have any ideas on what this derivative is gonna look like? Well, the first one will be exactly the same, right? A mm -hmm. e to the t. Anyone remember what the natural log is? Uh, is it B1 or B over T, I guess? Mm -hmm. So the derivative of B to the ln T is going to be equal to B times the derivative of the natural log of T. Which is equal to B times 1 over T. So yeah, precisely. Um, any questions about section 3.1 as of right now? Or 3.2, excuse me. If not, we can try to do a couple from 
3.5. I can find 3.5 in the book. I feel, like this I feel like this lesson is like very deceptive for what we're going to be doing next week. Really? 3.5? Well, no, just the whole 3.1, 3.2, and 3.5. Yeah. It makes it seem like, oh, this is so easy. And then There's, we do the next week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you get into 3.3 three three and it's like. Little problems, then we can do a couple of those just to like get you started for next week. Um because it can be really hard to like start to process like what's happening with the chain rule and the product rule. Um, let's do a couple from 3.5 um, and then I have a request to do one of the problems from 3.5. Um, let's do problems. Let's do two. Uh, let's to... Sorry, I have to like be careful because some of these problems are chain rule problems, which maybe we can talk about just a little bit in this. Let's do eight. For some reason, this is on my list of problems to do. Which this they introduce to you, I think, as like a this is how you take a rule of like a sign of something with something in it, just like they do with e to the kt. Um, but in reality, those are examples of the chain rule. So maybe we can kind of talk about like loop that in with what's happening with number eight. Um, and then. We can do, let's just start with this for now. Um, for number two, y is equal to five sine x. What are we gonna look at to solve this? Unfortunately, all of the trig functions have different rules that you need to just memorize for the derivatives. Um, does anyone remember what the rule for sine is? Cosine. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So this is going to be y prime is equal to 5, because that's a constant, times cos x. Now, what about for this? Oh, this is sign again. Never mind. Um, I'm going to change the problem we're doing. Let's let's just do this one. Okay. Um, how would we go about solving this one? I think they gave you a rule. Yeah, that um, one would be three cosine three x. Yep. And can you tell me why that is? Um, I memorized that rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, do you guys want me to get into a chain rule explanation of why this is? If you guys have like read over a little bit of like next week's stuff? Because it's a very good, like simple chain rule to go through. If you'd like to. And I like I don't want to get into like you know next week stuff before it's like time. But if it would be helpful helpful to you to see this at the start of the week, then and I think it probably would be. Yeah, I would like to. Okay. So does anyone remember what the chain rule is? That's the um, like f prime times g. Mm-hmm. Is it plus? F times G prime? Um, that is the product rule. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Um, so this is going to look something like this. So basically what we're saying here is we have a composite function. If you remember kind of going over those at the beginning, we have a function within a function. 
And in order to take the derivative of it, we need to take the derivative of the outer function and um, then the derivative of the inner function. So in order to like fill out what this is, um, I, and I do this almost every time I solve a chain rule problem, define what the outer functions and the inner functions are. So in this case, I would have the function f of g, where f of g is going to be equal to sine g. And then I would have the function, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the color, but I haven't used yet. Let's do it. Have the function g of x, where g is equal to 3x. So if I were to put this together, I would have something that looks like the sine of 3x. Is everybody okay with composite functions and how I've set this up? Like, feel free to stop me if I like, if I jump over something. The next thing I wanna do for both of these is now that I've decided what my outer function, my f is, and what my inner function, which is my g, um, is I need to take the derivatives of both of these parts. I want to find f prime of g, which as we stated in, as in problem two is gonna be cos g. And I need to find g prime of x, which is going to be what? Three. Three. So now I can put these pieces together. Um, I need to, in order to get this derivative, I need f prime of g of x, times g prime of x. So f prime of g is going to be cos g, and we said that g is equal to 3x, right? So we have cos 3x times g prime of x, which is 3. So our final answer is going to be f prime of x is equal to three times cos three x. So they kind of gave it to you as a rule, but it is like, this is the chain rule. And if you ever forget what the rule is, then you can always use the chain rule and say, what is my outer function? In this case, it's gonna be sine of something. And then my inner function is that something, which is the 3x. Does that make sense in terms of using the chain rule to solve this problem? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, it is the same deal if you have something that looks like this. Um, if I had, let's do the exact same one we had before. We had e to the negative 4x. We could break this into something that looks like e to the uh, g, where g is equal to negative 4x. So really all this is is doing a lot of definitions, like I'm calling this something else, um, in order to be able to work with it more easily. So. That is essentially what's happening here. Um, and I always, whenever I have like a chain rule problem, break it down into what is my outer function? This is my F. What is my inner function? This is my G. Um, I need to fit these together in a certain way. Um, I need to find F prime. I need to find G prime in order to do that. Okay. Um, let's make sure we do number 25 because I got a request for number 25. unless anyone has questions about the chain rule stuff that we just kind of discussed. Okay, let's try this. Uh, the average adult takes about 12 breaths per minute. As a patient inhales, the volume of air in the lung increases. As a patient exhales, the volume of air in the lungs decreases. 
For T in seconds since the start of the breathing cycle, the volume of air inhaled or exhaled since T is equal to zero is given. <clears throat> Excuse me. Given in hundreds of cubic centimeters by this function. How long is one breathing cycle? And find a prime of one and explain what it means. So how would we solve A? How can we determine how long a breathing cycle is? Or rather, let's, let's rephrase that. What is a breathing cycle? But I were to think about what the graph of this looks like. I would say it looks a little something like this. And I would also say that because I'm looking at a cosine, this is one period. from where I start to where I end. And that is what we're gonna call one cycle. Now, this is kind of like a throwback to when we were talking about trig functions a couple of weeks ago. Um, but does anyone remember what the, um, like the difference between these numbers are? Like uh, the amplitude, the period, and then I forget what the other one's called, but it's the shift. Yeah, it's the vertical <laughs> shift. Yeah. So I drew this a little incorrectly. I would actually need to draw it something like this. Or maybe, well, probably like this because there's not going to be any like negative um, volume, right? The idea is that there's always something, some air in your lungs, so it's not going to be like a negative, which is why this vertical shift is here. Um, but that's not what we care about right now. What we care about is the period, which is given to us by B. Now, what is the relationship of B and the period? Yeah, it's a little bit of a throwback. So, <clears throat> this is going to be equal to or rather the period is going to be equal to two pi over b, right? So my period is going to be equal to two pi divided by two pi times five. These are going to cancel out, and my one cycle, my period, five units, which in this case are seconds. So this was less about finding a derivative and more about using a, um, like a periodic function. This is a bit of throwback to like, what was it, 1.10? Um, so we got that. Now the question is, we need to find its derivative. Anyone have any ideas on what this derivative is gonna look like? Well, one thing that we can do is break it down. 
if we have something that looks like a to the t equals negative 2 cos g plus 2, where g of t, so this is actually, we're going to call it a to the g, g of t is equal to 2 pi over 5 t. Then what is a prime of g? So if I'm just solving this with respect to G. Would, would it be two cosine G? Mm. I'm sorry, two, two sine G. Yes. The two is definitely staying. It's no longer negative. You got that? Sine G. And then this two gets turned into a plus zero. So we can just drop it. Now what about G of T? G prime of T is going to be equal to Got a constant, you've got a single variable to the first power. So two pi over five. Mm -hmm. And so if I have to use the chain rule, the chain rule would tell me that I have a prime of just regular g of t, in this case g of t, times g prime of t. So the pieces I have to put together look like this. This is a prime, let's call it a prime of t is equal to, I should have renamed this to be f, should have renamed this to be f, should have renamed this to be f. Just to differentiate between these two so that we didn't miss out on a piece. So this is going to be equal to 2 sine of the quantity 2 pi over 5 t times g prime of t, which looks like 2 pi over 5. So my final answer will look like a prime of t is equal to 4 pi over 5 sine 2 pi over 5 t. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question was not just asking us to find the derivative. The question was asking us to find a prime of one and explain what it means. So how would I find a prime of one? You would plug one in for the T. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't actually know what the sign of two pi over five is. So I'm going to Google it right now. Um, Turns out it's nearly one. Um, and now I'm going to multiply it by four pi, five by five. So a prime of one is equal to 2.39. What does this number mean? Well, 
What does the one mean? Just one second. Mm -hmm. So we're looking specifically at the time. Um, what does, sorry, sometimes it just like helps to like break things down. So we're looking at specifically t is equal to one second. What does the derivative of this function mean? The original function is dealing with how much air is in somebody's lungs. And derivative is rate of change. So we're really looking at the rate of change with respect to time of air in a person's lungs. So this number is the rate of change. This number is positive which indicates mm -hmm. that as time goes on, the air is increasing. That tells me that I screwed something up up here. What did I miss when I was sketching out this graph? The negative in front of the two. Exactly. My graph is actually going to look something like this. So. I fixed the fact that I missed this negative sign. And I know that as T goes on, the air is increasing in the lungs. And that's what A prime of one means. Um, this indicates more specifically that if I were to increase by like a small, like by like one, for instance, if I were to move on to A of two, A of two is approximately equal to a of 1 plus 2.39. Not exactly, but this is kind of telling us how much this is going to increase if we move over by x is equal to 1. So that's like what the number itself means, but I think the most important takeaway here is that it's positive, which means we're increasing air in our lungs at this particular moment in time. Are there any questions about 25? Are there any questions about anything in 3.5, 3.2, or 3.1? Um, if you guys would like to, we could do a problem from 3.3. Um, Obviously, it's a little bit jumping the gun, but if that would help you guys as you're kind of doing this week's work in 3.3, then we could totally do a little bit of that. It's up to you. Or we can just call it a night because that's pretty much all I've got for you for now for the sections that we did this week. 3.3 would be good. Sweet. All right. Um, let me check. I have a list of problems that are good to do. Let me look at them real quick. Okay, um, let's start with number, we're in 3.3, let's start with number six, which looks something like this. Um, and then we're also going to do number eight, which looks something like this. <clears throat> so part of number three is, well, section 3.3, is recognizing what is the inner function and what is the outer function. What do you think my outer function is in, or I guess there are really two ways to look at this. 
what it, what is what is the inner function first, and then what is my outer function, or what is my outer function first, and then it, what is my inner function? So you can kind of work from the outside in or from the inside out. Um, honestly, I think working from the inside out is a little bit more intuitive. Um, I'll just say that I tend to look for parentheses. So anything in a parenthesis, I look to see if something's being like acted on it. For instance, this negative nine to the negative 90th power is like acting on what's inside of these parentheses. Um, so let's instead start with asking the question, what is the inside function? What is g of x? And then we'll call our outside function h of x. And we'll say that uh, in this case, I have to switch up the variables because I got an f of x here, but we'll say that f prime of x is equal to h prime of g of x times g prime of x. So it's just the chain rule, but with some letters swapped out. So your inside function would be x to the third plus x to the second? Mm-hmm. And then what variable would you use for the outside function? I tend x. to, you're right. I do tend to write it like this, as a g instead of an x. Just because for me, that makes it very clear what I'm substituting in. So I would call this g to the negative 90. And then it also tells me explicitly, this is a G and this is the same G. So step two, I need to find what these derivatives are. What is the derivative of G to the negative 90? Negative 90 G to the negative 91st power. Mm -hmm. What about the derivative of G of X? 3x to the second plus 2x. Awesome. So now I need to put these two pieces together. I need to put them together in a very specific way. I need h prime, which I know is going to be this chunk here. So negative 90 g to the negative 91. This is my original g, not my g prime right now. And now I have to multiply it by g prime, which is this. So my final answer is f prime of x is equal to 3x squared plus 2x times negative 90 times x cubed plus x squared to the negative 91st power. Does that make sense to everybody? What about number eight? Is there something I can do to number eight to make it more workable? You can rewrite it to the one half power. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at something that's very similar to what we just worked with, right? So what is going to be my outside function? And what is going to be my inside function? Well, the inside would be what's in the parentheses. Mm -hmm. Parentheses are a really good signpost for this kind of stuff. So my outside function would be what? I have g to the, the one half. Half. So what is my f prime of g? One half g to the negative one half. And my g prime of s. Three. 
3s squared. Mm -hmm. So with these pieces, I can build my final answer. And what is that going to look like? be one half g to the negative one half times five to is that s or five? that's s to the third plus one it's actually this s to the third plus one is going to be this g yep. and then g prime is what we need to multiply it by but basically yeah so our final answer is going to be y prime is equal to 3s squared over 2 times s cubed plus 1 to the negative 1 half. Or I could write this as like a radical in the denominator or, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to write this, but this would be a perfectly acceptable answer. And I'm sorry, my s's do look like fives. Okay, um, let's try Um, trying to look for what I think is going to be, sorry, a lot of the times, at least what my calculus professor did to me was, um, he would give us really awful homework problems and quizzes, and then, like, we basically saw the worst of the worst of the chain rule, or the product rule, or whatever, and so the messier the problems got, the more, like, you know, we'd have to start thinking about them, and then he'd give us just, like, standard stuff on like exams, and it would seem like a piece of cake after seeing like just a complete mess of like letters and numbers. Um, so I'm trying to find the really messy ones. I gotta tell you, like for this section, the, the first 27 or whatever I felt were not bad as long as I took my time, uh -huh. but it was the word problems that messed okay, me let's up. Do one of those then. Okay. Um. Maybe 37? Do you think 37 would be a good problem to do? Yes, I have a big question mark beside that one when I was trying to do it earlier. <laughs> okay. So 37 says that the distance S of a moving body, and I'm actually going to rewrite that as X because as we just decided, my S's look like fives. And I'm just, no, that's not going to be something that's fixable, I guess. Um, so the distance x of a moving body from a fixed point is given as a function of time by the function x is equal to 20e to the t over 2. So this is a function x of t. Um, so find the velocity v of that body as a function of t. So this question is very much banking on you understanding something that physicists are taught very like, like basic physics um, very early on. Um, and I don't know if they actually explicitly said this in your book, um, but there's a relationship between distance and I'm gonna draw it actually over here. There is a relationship uh, between distance slash position, velocity, and acceleration. I can't spell. Um, and that, that is that velocity is the derivative of dis position, essentially, and that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And at some point in time during this class, we'll learn about integration, which is basically backwards derivation. Like if you add something, you can subtract it. If you take the derivative of something, you can basically 
untick the derivative of it. Um, but we're not going to worry about that for right now. Right now, we just need to know that, for instance, a of t is equal to the derivative of velocity with respect to time, which is equal to the derivative of position twice with respect to time. And velocity is equal to the derivative of position. So now that we know all of that, um, which is something that they should probably have told you before you started doing this problem, um, and this is something that will come up, just velocity and position and their relation, um, because math and physics kind of go hand in hand. How do you think we're going to solve this problem? We are just going to take the derivative of this with respect to t. This is another reason I love Leibniz notation is because I can, you know, explicitly say we're taking this derivative with respect to time. Um, so dx dt is equal to the derivative of this part here. And what is the derivative with respect to time of 20e to the t over 2? Is there a way that we could maybe rewrite that? That would make it a little bit easier to work with. I would rewrite this as x of t is equal to 20 e to the 1 half times t. Do we know how to solve this? How to get that derivative? Well, you'll, you'll carry the 20 because it's a constant. Mm -hmm. And then multiply 1 half times mm -hmm. e to the 1 half t. So the x dt is equal to 10 e to the t over 2. Right? And as we just set up here, this is equal to v of t. So the derivative of this distance or position is the velocity. And that kind of does make sense in that if we're like, if you think of a car moving from point A to point B, we can like graph that like distance on a, on a graph. And how fast that car is going from point A to point B could be like the slope of that graph. Um, and that slope would indicate how fast they were going. So a steeper slope means they're getting there faster. So that's kind of the relationship between here. Does that kind of make sense? There wasn't a lot of like chain rule going on here, but there is a lot of like loaded language that may not be fully explained in the section. Um, let's maybe see if there's another word problem we can try. Um, is there another word problem that you have a question mark by, maybe? Um, I think there were actually most of them, but I, I tend to go back to tutor.com after I go through them and get, mm -hmm. get help with them. Um, I'm trying to look to see. Um, 
had some issues on the ones with the graphs, but I think it's just because I'm not estimating the points they're asking for correctly. <laughs> yeah, I like always am super hesitant to like throw up a graph on like Zoom because I always like horribly misrepresent the graph. Yeah. And it's really hard to estimate. Are you guys maybe feeling a little bit better about the chain rule? You're perfectly within your rights to say no. Let's do some more practice. Um, I think number 19 could be really interesting. Number 19 looks something like this. What do you guys think the inner function would be? The natural log of x. And what is the derivative of the natural log of x? 1 over x. And what about the outer function? The natural log of oh, whatever variable we use for that. Yeah, we'll call it g. Okay. So how am I going to put this together? So you'd multiply 1 over x times 1 over g. So this is 1 over, yeah, 1 over g is going to be 1 over ln x times 1 over x. Um, natural logs sometimes throw people off, but you seem to be handling them just fine. Um, did you guys want to do a couple like product rule problems? Again, this is like working ahead a little bit, but if it would help you to do them now, then we can totally do that. I'm good doing some of them because I mean we've got to do the quiz on those at some like in a couple days and then. All right, let's do it then. We, we got a midterm next weekend, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's do. Hmm. All right, I'm trying to find a couple of good ones. Um, let's do number five. And then also let's do number 18. I think we should start with number 18, actually. So for number 18, what do you think? Um, when we use the product rule, um, like in the chain rule, we said that we have to have a function within a function. For the product rule, we need to have two functions multiplied by one another. So what are my two functions that I will have to multiply by one another? I'm going to call one of them f of x and I'm going to call the other one g of x. Any ideas what these two functions are going to be? One would be x and one would be 2 to the x. So that means I need to find g prime of x and f prime of x. So what would f prime of x be? About uh, one. Mm -hmm. And g prime of x? Uh, 
Is that the, the rule that involves the natural log? Mm -hmm. So the natural log of two times two to the X. Perfect. Okay, so now the question is how do we put this together? And how we put it together looks like this. Something like that. So we have all of the pieces now. We have f prime of x, which is 1, which gets multiplied by g of x, which is 2 to the x, plus g prime of x, which is the natural log of 2 times 2 to the x, times f of x, which is going to be x. My final answer, y prime, is going to be equal to 2 to the x plus x ln 2. Actually, I'm going to rewrite that. Yeah, that's fine. x ln 2 times 2 to the x. So, yeah. Any questions about that one? not let's do number five so for number five in order to do the product rule um we are going to have to identify what the two functions are that we are multiplying we got a three there so what two functions are we multiplying T squared. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what f of t, f prime of t is? Um, 2t. Mm -hmm. And now we also have to find the other function. So that's the 3t plus 1 um, raised to the third power. Mm -hmm. And g prime of t. So I, I just did this problem a couple of hours ago. Oh yeah. So I I, I think that one I'm trying to read over my, my scribbles here. Um, nine times three t plus one raised to the second power. Because I, I broke that up using the chain rule. I don't mm -hmm. know if that was the right way to do it or not, but that's, that's exactly what I did. What you need to do. I'm actually going to write the whole chain rule out just because we're doing a section on chain rules right now. Um, but the important thing about this problem is that we have the chain rule. We need to use the chain rule to solve the product, the, the problem using the product rule. Because we've broken it down into these two multipliable chunks, but in order to get the derivative of one of those chunks, we need to employ the chain rule, which in this case I'm going to say the outer function, which is going to be, uh, call it h of j, is equal to j to the third. Where j of t is equal to 3t plus 1. And we drop the t. So this is the first one, so this is just going to be the derivative of 3t, which is 3, and then we drop the plus 1 because it turns into a 0. So we can put this together such that 3 times 3t plus 1 squared times 3. And as you said, this is equal to 9 3t plus 1 squared. So now we have all of the pieces that we need to solve it using the product rule. And we had to use the chain rule to get there. But now we can put it together using the product rule, which again looks a little bit something, sorry, color coding, I have to keep going back to the palette. Um, looks a little bit something like this. So 
So f prime of t, we said, is 2t times g of t, which is 3t plus 1 to the third, plus g prime of t, which is 9 times 3t plus 1 to the second, times f of t, which is t squared. So we can simplify this all out and say that y prime is equal to 2t, 3t plus 1 cubed, plus 9t squared, 3t plus 1 squared. And that is how you solve that problem. So the important things to take away here are make sure you memorize those formulas and always break it down into its like constitutive parts essentially. And that's going to be your tactic for solving all of these different problems. Any questions on how that got solved? Could you also go over, um, I think that's problem 13 from that section. <laughs> problem 13, um, is it f of x is equal to x squared plus 3 over x? Yes, that one. Okay. Um, so what rule do you think we're going to use to solve this problem? Um, well, this is the quotient rule, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what are our constitutive parts? What is being derived, or not derived, what is being divided by what? Do you mean what is the rule for this? Um, I was more going for if I have to split this into a h of x and a um, like a g of x, what are my h of x and g of x? Oh, okay. So one would be the numerator and one would be the denominator. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to actually write out this whole rule down here. And we're going to say that the derivative of h of x over g of x is equal to g of x um, h of x h prime of x minus h of x g prime of x sorry the when it comes to the product rule it doesn't matter which of these primes go first um, because you're just adding them, but it does matter when you're doing the quotient rule. So I do believe it's the numerator first and then the denominator second. So it's the, I think it's arranged in this manner, but if anyone would like to correct me, then that would be fine. Pretty sure this is correct though. Um, so this is the rule that we're going to be using essentially. Given this, we can say that h of x is going to be the numerator, which is x squared plus 3. Um, what is h prime of x? Two x. Mm -hmm. So also given this, we have our denominator, which is going to be x, and g prime of x, as we said in the last problem, is going to be 1. So now we get to put all of this together and say that the derivative, which we'll call f prime of x, is equal to h prime 
g minus g prime. I'm taking out the of x's here just for convenience's sake. H all over g squared. So h prime is 2x times g of x, which is x, minus g prime, which is 1, times h, which is x squared plus 3, all over g squared. And so g of x is x, so this is you're going to turn out to be x squared. So now in order to simplify it, we're going to write this out as 2x squared minus x squared minus 3 over x squared. Or 2x squared minus x squared is going to be x squared, right? Minus 3 over x squared. And this is what our answer is going to be. Okay, I guess I probably need to look at the textbook errors for this one because that's the answer I got, but that's not the answer listed in the back of the book. So that, maybe that's where my confusion was coming from. Here, actually, we'll just pull from off it. Um, I should be right, but. Sorry, give me just two seconds. Um, okay, so something went wrong here. This is not what the derivative is. No, it is. It is. What was the book, the answer in the back of the book? The answer in the back of the book says um, 1 minus 3 over x squared. Okay. That is also the answer that Wolfram Alpha gave me. Um, now the question is, are these the same? The answer is yes. Because if I were to take this and split it up and say that this is x squared over x squared minus 3 over x squared, which is something that I can do because it's the same uh, denominator, this would turn into 1 minus 3 over x squared. Okay. It seems like for some of these answers, they simplify it down further, and for some they don't, and I guess I just don't know. Yeah, it's really hard to gauge what exactly they want from you. Um, on, like, a multiple choice exam, that's also, it can be really rough, um, mm -hmm. because you have to, like, get it in the exact form that they want. Like, do they want a radical in the denominator, or can you just say to the negative one-half? And that's, you know, not ideal. Um, but... Yeah, a lot of the times it's just twisting it to be in the form that it want, they want it to be in. So you you were right this whole time. It was just... Well, I think I was probably not reading it correctly. Um, as I, I don't know why, but the way in the book, even though there's no parentheses, I was taking it as the numerator was 1 over 3 and the denominator was x squared, mm, which yeah. was confusing me even more. So. Um. But yeah, if you think that the book has a wrong answer, um, if it's just like find a derivative, you can always plug it into Wolfram Alpha and they'll spit out the derivative for you. Um, I think you have to subscribe to get the step-by-step -step solution, but just to check to make sure the book is working okay, then Wolfram Alpha is a good bet. Okay. Any other questions? If not, then I'm probably going to wrap up, if that's all right with you guys. Um, as always, feel free to send me questions during the week that you'd like to cover in um, the session next week. And yeah.
if there are any other questions. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye.